I uh Depression's ugly, yo, honey, your battle Sunday to Sunday, this junk ain't funny, yo, I hope you smile today, cause you're a person, you're worth it, your battle's for sure, you verge it, nobody's perfect, so I hope you smile today, somebody loves you, I love you, I know you feel so in trouble, your hustle humble, still I hope you smile today, cause you're impressive, your pressure is so excessive, your aura is so protective, yo, I hope you smile today. You got a mission, a reason for why you living is vivid, but your mind tripping. Still, I pray you smile today. Just for no reason, you breathing, you unachieving, it's leaving, hopelessly dreaming. But I saw you smile today. In all your glory, your story so territorial. It's mandatory to listen to what you put through. Up. I heard the glory, your fury is channeled through your heart. Your story's beautiful, you better smile today. You better show some teeth, give yourself relief. All your resiliency, you better smile today. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's uh, last economic empowerment series workshop. My name is Noshina Hussein, and I am the executive director of Reviving the Islamic Sisterhood for Empowerment. We are on a mission to amplify the voice and power of Muslim women, and I'm so grateful that all of you are here tonight. Uh, I got to give a shout out to my awesome team, um, Zainab Abdi, uh, Asma Muhammad, Camila Guzman, uh, Leila Altawili, she is our board board chair, actually. Um, Sumaya and Sumaya, I don't, and I think that hopefully that's that's everyone from my team. Iman, sorry, Iman, you're here. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> so I think many of you know it used to be a one person show, and then it was just me and Asma. Now, Alhamdulillah, we have eight people on the team, so it's really exciting to see um, all your all of uh, all of this wonderful team. Um, as you know, we have a program around uh, leadership development and this year because we um, weren't able to do our annual conference, we took that conference and really spread it out over the course of the year um, and launched this economic empowerment series. We realized that when uh, 
women are socialized not to really think about wealth and money and finances. And we wanted to make sure that our Muslim sisters were um, educated on a lot of different topics. And so we launched this program. We've got, we've had about six different workshops. Tonight is the sixth one. And we're really excited. We've had um, topics around just understanding um, how to build wealth and really reframing our minds about that. We had um, talked with somebody from Sharia Portfolio about halal investing. Uh, we also went deep in understanding zakat and um, how to uh, sh not only build the wealth, but then purify the wealth and uh, distribute it amongst our community members who need it. Um, and following that, we last one we had was around um, how to start a business. And so we had two amazing entrepreneurs share their journey and really help Muslim women see themselves as, you know, the next entrepreneur in, in Minnesota. So welcome to all of you. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Zainab so that she can uh, start us off with some Quran. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. My name is Zainab. And I'm going to start reading Surah Al-Fatiha, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Imanik yawm al-Din. Iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka nasta'in. Ahdina al-Sirat al-Mustaqim. Sirat al-Ladina namta alayhim. Ghayr al-Maghdubi alayhim wa al-Zalim. Ameen. Ameen, Ameen. Jazakallah khair, Zainab, alhamdulillah. We always want to bless our um, our events and our surroundings and environment with uh, words from Allah. And so without further ado, I want to introduce our amazing um, speakers tonight. Uh, first up, we are going to uh, have Asiya from Premier Starter. Um, Asiya is the founder and CEO of Premier Starter, a financial growth company that focuses on personal credit coaching, business credit coaching, and business foundation mentorship. For the last five years, she has dedicated her time building the community around her ownership and financial literacy programs. She's always been her passion, and she's a Minnesota native born and raised here. Her goal is to close the financial literacy gap here in America. So please, let's give her a warm welcome. Hey, everybody. <laughs> that was a great introduction. Um, thank you. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Atia, um, founder and CEO of Premier Starter. Um, one thing um, that I am going to go over today is understanding credit. Um, I do have a short time and I wish we can talk a lot and maybe a couple hours, but I don't have that much time. So we're going to dive right in. I will share my screen with you guys. I have um, a PowerPoint presentation for you all. So give me one second. Let me share. And then let me do this. So you guys, we're going to talk a little bit about understanding your credit score. The biggest thing for me, especially when it comes to your credit is number one, understanding it. Okay. So um, we are going to dive right in. So understanding credit. So what is a credit score, you may ask, right? A credit score is a number that's generated by a mathematic formula. It goes from what, 300 to 850. The higher the score is, the more likely you are going to get accepted for a loan. The lower score is, is the less likely, um, less likely that you are going to get a loan. So if you have a low credit score to manage and to get approved for credit um, and so on and so forth. So you have... Um, having a higher credit score could save you thousands of dollars. Um, what are the credit bureaus? And a lot of people ask, why is there multiple bureaus? Um, the three bureaus, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion are privately owned agencies that are regulated by the government. So the credit bureaus, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion have their own set laws, whatever they want to do, but then they are regulated under the CFPB, which is the which is um, a government agency. So the government regulates them, they don't own them, okay? So with um, reporting and how the reporting for um, the credit works and your credit reporting, um, consumers, which is a person or a corporation who purchases goods, services, for personal or business purpose, okay? Um, the business bureaus, which is the three bureaus, there's a lot more bureaus. There's also secondary reporting agencies, but the three bureaus that a lot of creditors do focus on is TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. Um, 
And that's, they report to them about every single 30 days. Okay. Um, and these bureaus collect and store your information. So every time you make a payment, all that you do um, for future reference is the trustworthiness that they do have um, to trust you, right? When you're buying a car, when you are um, getting a loan, when uh, with all of that, buying a home and everything, okay? So your behavior can be reviewed in the future for risk levels. So your personal credit score could range from 300 to 850. Um, a credit score about 700 to 720 and above is genuinely like, you know, considered to be a good score. Um, an 800 score and above is the same range and considered to be excellent, okay? Um, most credit scores do fall from 600 to 750. Um, the higher the score is, is the more that you are going to be approved for any credit, okay? So this, ooh, let me see if it's gonna, so this is the biggest thing. So every single bureau has, could, could you hear me? I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Every single bureau has this scaling. So if you understand this formula, right. And I use the um, analogy of like, you drive a car and you would never press the brakes for you to, you know, for you to go, you have to press the gas. Right. So for you to understand everything about credit, if you understand this part right here that I'm showing you, and I'm, we're going to go into detail of each one, um, you are going to be set. Okay. So understanding that there is the five, I call it the credit pie chart and understanding the credit pie chart. So payment history being the first thing, 35% of your credit accounts to payment history. So on-time payments, um, anything, so credit cards, loans, anything that reports to the bureaus um, is considered you know, that they're reporting it. Now, a lot of people ask like, does my cell phone bills get reported? No, they actually don't unless you have like a certain thing, but usually they don't. Utility bills don't unless they do go into um, collections. That's the only time that they'll report it. A lot of the times having um, your credit about two years, you could say for the first two years, 24 months is when it's weighed the most. Okay. So making sure you're making your payments on time. And that is crucial because your payment um, payment history that accounting to 35% could drop your score almost 70 points. Just like one late payment could drop your score up to like 70, 60 to 70 points. And it's happened, okay? The capacity of amount owed, and that confuses a lot of people. So in the chat right now, who has credit cards? Do you guys have credit cards? So chat with, type in the chat to tell me if you guys have credit cards. Well, your credit card accounts to 30% of your credit, okay? So the capacity of amount that's owed. So how much of that credit limit is available? So let's just say you have $1,000 available in your credit, okay? That is accounting to 30% of your credit. So the more you're utilizing is the lower your score is going to be, okay? So a lot of the times people will say, well, I heard that it's the utilization should be 30%. I personally will say, and you can do 30%, but for you to be excellent, right? There's excellent, there's good, and then there's fair. 30 to 49% is fair. We don't want to be fair, especially when you're trying to buy a house, right? You want to be excellent. You want to show these lenders that you are paying your bills on time. Your credit utilization is low. And guess what? If you do have a higher credit limit right now, Utilize 10%. So make sure that even if you do pay, even if you use the whole thousand dollars, okay, make sure you're paying it down um, before your statement date. So a couple of days, like make sure you're just paying it down um, before your due date. A lot of the times people will ask me like, well, we heard that there is a couple of dates for your credit cards. Yes, there's three, right? There's a closing date, there's a due date, and then there's a statement date. Okay. Oh, somebody was, okay, there's a statement date. So just making sure that you are paying um, and utilizing your credit cards at a lower rate, because then that shows that they could trust you with a lot of money. So I'll give you guys an example for those who are a little bit confused, right? So like, let's say the bank gives you $1,000. $1,000 is a little bit, but let's just say that the $1,000 is $100,000, okay? Would you want the bank to see that you're using 99,000? No, right? That's a lot of money. So they see your $500 credit card, $1,000 credit card as 
as for that much. So they see you utilizing as much as that. So just, you know, be very, um, look at it like you're, they're trusting you with the money and that you just have to pay for it. So I make that the biggest thing, if you have high limits on your credit cards, make sure you pay that down before anything because your credit score is going to jump crazy. Okay, so another thing is the length of credit. So how long have you had your accounts? If you have credit cards you do not use, do not close them, especially when you're getting close to buying a house because that actually drops your score. The reason why it's dropping your score is because it's 15% of your credit. And what it does is it's the length of how long it was open. So imagine if you had a 10-year card or a five-year card closed down, you just dropped how long you've had your accounts. Okay, so like the age just dropped and you don't want that. You want to lower that down. Um, you make sure that you're not closing any accounts down, especially when you are getting close to buying a house. That is so important because you want to see be seen by any lender or anything, especially when it comes to buying a home, that you're not closing anything and your credit score is not dropping. And I see that happen a lot where there's like store cards that you're not using anymore. And you're like, well, that's not going to hurt me if I go and close my Sam's Club credit card down. Well, it is going to hurt you if it was over a year, right? Even, even the ones that are pretty, like, just don't close any cards, especially when you're getting into the process of buying a home, okay? Um, new credit. This is huge. When you are, so in the comments, you could tell me too, um, when you go and apply for a new credit, do you notice how your credit score drops? Has anybody come across that, right? It's because it accounts to 10% of your credit. You guys, that's huge. That's a huge amount. So every time you're applying for something, it drops your score because it accounts to 10%. Now, if it's something that has been approved or you got a new card, it'll drop down for a little bit and then it'll go right back up. Just like the way when you do buy a home, your credit score is bound to drop. You'll be like, why did my score drop so low? It's because yes, the you know lenders are and all, um, and loan officers, whatever, they're pulling your credit score and all of that because of the inquiries that's gonna happen and you got a new loan, all of that is gonna happen. But imagine applying for a card, getting declined and then applying for another one and getting declined and then applying for another one and getting declined. Cont continuously keep applying for cards and guess what happens? you are going to, your score is going to drop. You have a ton of inquiries on there. They're going to see it. And the reason why some lenders might even decline you for like a loan or anything is because you have too much inquiries. So stop applying for it. If your credit is not good and you are planning on working on it, do not apply for any unnecessary credit. Okay. Um, and if you are getting declined, they should give you like every single, um, let's just say you're applying for a bank, like you're in, credit union or something. And then they gave you a credit card de decline letter. It will give you the reason on why they declined you. So then now I will give you steps on how to check your credit score for free and all of those things. Um, but to actually go and check that and just be like, okay, this is the reason why a lot of the times it's very minimal too. Like the reason why they declined, you might just be you're applying for too many things or your credit limits are way too high and your utilization for your credit cards are too high. So that's why they're declining you. Okay. Another type is types of credit used. So that is 10%. Mixing your credit accounts is huge. Okay. So installment loans, and revolving loans. Installment loans will be anything from car loans, mortgages, um, student loans, all of that. Revolving meaning lines of credit, credit cards, charge cards, store cards, all of that, okay? So just making sure that you guys understand this. If you follow everything, making sure you're making your payments on time, having credit card limits on the ultimate low, not closing down lengths of like lengths of your basically not closing out any cards or anything of that sort making sure that you're not applying for just unnecessary credit cards and then types of credit use making sure that you are mixing and matching your um you know the installment loans and revolving loans you should be at an amazing amazing score now is that going to take some time yes just you know the building process of your or you know keeping um a steady credit score of a perfect score is nearly impossible right like 
but then you could have an amazing score. Some people are like, well, I need to get to, to over 800. Well, that's gonna take a little bit of time, but that doesn't mean just because you're not at 800, you don't have a good credit score. 750 to 800 is pretty good as well, okay? Now, let me go on next. Now, the behaviors that is evaluated in your credit report, do you pay your bills on time? Okay, that's one big question. Do you pay your bills on time? Do you have long credit history? Making sure that, like I said, just in the previous um, you know, slide, uh, have you applied for credit recently? And what is your outstanding debt? So for the most part, and a lot of people in my credit coaching program, we do talk about this. They're like, well, Asiya, what if like I'm in collections and you know, I have all of this debt and what could I do? Well, the first thing I would tell you to do is first review your credit report, right? But then also understand that they sold your debt. So this creditor has sold your debt to somebody else. You never gave them permission to do so. So they have to verify that under the FCRA, you are protected and they, it has to be verifiable. So I'm not saying don't accept the debt, right? But it might be inaccurate and they might have, you know, inaccuracies in the credit, um, you know, those collection accounts. So making sure that you are, you know that you owe this and they give you the proof to do so if it does go to collections, okay? So just making sure that you are taking care if you are close to going to collections, making sure you stop it, call the creditor. If you do have accounts that are about to go to collections, if you are really past due on them and make a payment arrangement. Okay. So like tell them, Hey, you know, um, I've been going through a hardship. That word is very crucial because they will actually help you out. Um, Hey, I'm going through a hardship. Can I make a payment arrangement with you guys? I do not want to go into collections. They will work with you, but it's all about communication. You have to communicate with them because they are willing to work with you if you are working with you. Okay. So they're willing to do the work as well, but just understanding that making sure that you're not maxing out your credit cards and making sure you're making those payments. Even if um, you have a high, like your credit cards are really high right now, make sure you just pay a couple, you know, um, of payments in a month. Like if you get paid within two weeks, pay down an extra. So like, instead of paying the minimum, maybe pay double the minimum and just slowly keep doing that for a couple of months. So you're prepping yourself. So it's like reasonable and add, add that into your budget as well. Because the one thing that people don't tell you is that your credit literally accounts to almost everything buying, a, like even buying a house, set that aside, even renting, um, getting into anything. Um, it could really prevent you from all the hassle and the hardship. If you just, it's all about behavior. Um, and it's not about even when you do um, get your credit to the right space, it's all about maintaining it. And a lot of people don't talk about the maintaining part of your credit. Um, and it's all about maintaining it. So making sure you're maintaining your, you know, having a budget and making sure that you're paying your bills on time. Um, making sure that, you know, you're understanding and you're checking your credit report every 30 days, okay, and doing all of that. So now let's move on. Ooh, I don't know why it's... Okay, so a lot of people also do ask the difference between Vantage and FICO, okay? So you guys, I got this straight from the FICO website um, and the Vantage, and I just wanted to share this with you guys because a lot of people tend to be super duper confused, and I want you guys to also read the little bullet points that I put on there. One thing that you guys need to understand with Vantage and FICO score, they're literally the same. The only thing that is different is just the scoring scale. When it comes to the way that they determine your credit scores, it has similarities, a couple of differences, and that's why you might see your score a little bit lower and a little bit higher sometimes in your FICO score and sometimes in your Vantage. Um, does it mean that it's inaccurate? No. Some lenders, and this is super duper confusing as well, will use, hey, we're using Experian to, you know, the um, Experian's uh, credit report but some of them will use Equifax. Some collections might not report to experience. Some might just report to Equifax and it all just depends, but you will know that as soon as you're looking through your credit report. I personally like using both. I don't have like, you know, a difference between the two, um, but your FICO score is what is popular. A lot of people will tell you like, it's a popular, um, popular one that they will use. So. And then if you guys see that the only thing is just, they're both at 850, 
740 right here, it starts at 700 as good. Um, and, you know, so they have, they have that where it's fair, good, very good. And then it's poor, fair, and then good. So, and then there is Vantage. So Vantage has a couple, but the current one that you will see on your, um, you know, any report right now, Capital One, you will see Vantage and it will say 3.0. Um, you will see FICO. So if you look, Wells Fargo has FICO. So if you look on your Wells Fargo, it'll say FICO. Um, they look back about 24 months of activity. So it all depends on just the way that they're actually scaling it, which is not like, it's not different from each other. It's the exact same. It just has a little bit of discrepancies. Okay. Now the three steps that you take before buying your house, when it comes to your credit, first and foremost, request a free credit report at annualcreditreport.com. Anybody can do it. And because of COVID, you guys, it actually, there is a free report, I think every single month, usually it's every year, um, but they have a free report every single month. Um, and it's really, really nice. You could also call that number. So if you're taking some notes right now, just make sure you just chart that down. Um, review your credit report. Um, and when I say review your credit report, make sure that everything looks correct from the accounts that are open, from your personal information. Is your birthday accurate? Do you have the right addresses on there? Um, are the addresses correct? Do you have old addresses on there that you need to remove? Because why is my old addresses on my credit report? You know, I'm not there anymore. Um, do you have things that are reporting inaccurate? You guys almost 80, I think, and don't quote me 100%, 88% of credit reports were found to have in some type of inaccuracy. Okay. So it's around that range. So making sure that you're just looking through it, seeing if there is, you know, accounts that are open um, that are not yours because identity theft is real. Um, and then understanding where you could actually go. So if you guys do have um, some, and you do notice that you go on your credit report um, and you notice that there is like some type of weird activity or, um, identity theft or anything like that, um, please contact. So the first thing you're going to do is go and make a police report um, and make sure that you print that off and you go to them. Secondly, to talk um, and to go and contact someone from the FTC. Now that is the Federal Trade Commission and making sure that you are actually reporting that identity theft because you're, you need to protect yourself at all costs, okay? So like that actually happens more than usual. It happened to me. I had identity theft and I found out at 19 years old. So like it could happen to anybody. So protect yourselves. There's also um, identity theft protection, you guys, where you could actually get insurance um, for your credit. So just making sure you guys are looking at that. Um, I do have a direct program for that too. Um, and just making sure you're just protecting yourself because your credit is everything, okay? Uh, and then reporting any errors. So a lot of people ask like, how does disputing work? How could I dispute errors? Um, you know, what could I do? What do I type? How do I type it? Uh, and making sure that you are disputing through the bureaus. And um, I'm actually going to send a, a Zainab or uh, I, I for keep forgetting your name, but I will send you guys free templates on um, dispute letters on the way just to verify, um, you know, verifying debt and stuff. So you could actually give, uh, you know, the people that are here or in your network of people who actually do need it, um, act, the actual letters that you actually send them. So like step-by-step -step ways to write it. And I'll give you guys that um, without no cost or anything. Uh, I just want you guys just to have that. So you know exactly what you're writing and you don't feel like you know, you're lost and you're writing nothing to the bureaus because it's really important the way you do um, write your letters as well. So just making sure that you're reporting all inaccuracies and everything. Now, when you are disputing, there's a part and on your credit report, there's this thing called status. So like there's a comment, right? The comments, if it's something that you do owe and you do write saying um, consumer does not agree, when you are applying for any house loan or lending or anything like that, it could actually stop the process of you getting approved. So making sure that you are um, looking at those comments and like correcting them. If you do, if it's like something that, if it, it will say like FCRA verified or something, and then it'll say consumer disagrees. 
that's basically them saying we verified it and they still disagree with it and this person is not trustworthy <laughs> you know that's pretty much what they're saying so just making sure that you are correcting that um before you even go and try to get a loan or anything like that because either they're going to decline you and then you'll have all those inquiries which you guys is 10 percent of your credit or um you know they will just tell you that you need to actually fix that up so and that's that with um with that so if you guys have um yeah that's over with my presentation thank you asia um i know we still have four minutes before we transition so so we have a time for people to ask questions but if you feel they have a pressing question just let us know do you guys if anybody has questions do you guys want to type it in the chats and i can Oh, there are already a couple questions in the chat, so I just somebody you. read them. And I can go on here too. All right, I'll um, so can you read them, I, Asia? Can yeah. You read the questions? Okay, yeah, I otherwise, uh, otherwise I can help. Okay, there is a lot, okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, and there's, yup, so um, I think it's, a Asia Nelson or Asia Nelson. Um, she, um, so I, when it's, when it comes to interest, the way I avoid interest, and this is, I don't, I'm not going to say this is how you should do it, but this is the way I personally do it. I literally pay off almost my whole entire balance, um, before, and I've never had a problem. My credit score is great, but I don't get charged interest because my balance is almost fully paid. They don't really charge me. Um, and then when it comes to the personal loans that I do take, I didn't take anything um, with personal loans from the time, the first time I had no idea like how bad my credit was when I was 18 and with student loans, that's when I started to learn about credit. Um, and then I realized that, you know, interest is so crazy on how you could stay away from it when you have better credit. So I negotiate with some of the bankers and some of the lenders, especially now running a business. And I tell them like, well, I can't take that. So is there a way that, you know, we could work around like having 24 months, no, no APR and then paying for it and then making sure that I am actually paying that, you know, um, and avoiding that. So that's the biggest thing. It's really, especially in a country full of, we're, we're in a capitalistic country, right? Um, so it's really hard because people love to make money off of, um, interest. That's how they make their money. So, um, the, but then I <laughs> Um, you can you can pay parts um, every single month for your credit cards as well. What if you are always denied a card because you have a history? Um, beginner cards that I would say, I would not even tell you to get a credit card right away. Um, I would say there is two, there's two things that you can use, self and credit strong. Those two are, um, they have a way where they give you this loan for $2,000 or something. And you make monthly payments of like $20, $29. I don't know the exact price. And it's pretty much a savings account and it's building your credit. So it's reporting as you are making um, payments every single month. And that's causing basically saying that you're, you have positive payment history every single month, which accounts to 35% of your credit. Then when your credit boosts from those tools, then you could go ahead and get a credit card, but stay away from, um, you know, secured cards only because like, when you are purchasing a house, a, um, a car and all of those things, the underwriters look at that and it actually like disqualifies you from a lot. So just making sure that you're like, you know, there's other tools that you could, um, you could use as well, but, you know, making sure you build yourself up, especially when you're getting denied and then recognizing why you're getting denied to begin with. So like, is it because you have no credit? Is it because, you know, there's things on your, um, on your account that you need to fix and um, all of that. So that's um, a couple of things. So let me see what happens. Can you tell us where to get that self or, or credit strong? How do we yeah. find those? Yeah, let me actually add it in the chat. I will actually type it in here. Give me one second. Yep. So self, I'm actually gonna just um, type in the domain. Um, and then, give me, so creditstrong is creditstrong.com and I'm just typing it so I get the right domain for you guys. Give me one second. Okay, here it is. 
that's credit strong and then I'll get self. I don't have a credit card yet. Should I open a student card or build my credit? Marion, I think you should go on credit strong and do that before you even get on a credit card. Um, because yes, even though 30% of your credit is not being utilized right now, um, you will be better off to build your credit this, the, with smart credit, not smart credit, I'm sorry, credit strong, or with um, self and it's, you know, then go on with the credit card. If you guys think you will have more. Yeah, okay. And then. So I see, I think, um, I think we can take one more question and then we'll transition to uh, sister Joanna. Okay. Um, what is the best uh, credit card in your opinion? You guys, I have an American Express business, Business Blue, and I love American Express. Um, and I think the biggest thing for me with, with that is that the amount of points I get with that. So I pay all of my bills and then pay it on time, all of it. So I, I make sure I just swipe it with all my bills. My bills get paid for all of that and for my business. And then I just keep on doing that every single month. So it just gives me more points, more reward points. And I, and I just love it because that's free food, free flights, all that stuff. So that's one thing. Um, my report had the wrong employer information and a card I didn't recognize. Um, yes. So you could actually dispute that. So like with the employer information, you could dispute that. Um, and then a card that you did not recognize, um, you could also make sure that you reckon, and then on the bottom of your credit report, it actually gives you a phone number. So all the creditors that ever pulled your credit, it will show you even soft inquiries um, and then hard pull inquiries where that one is the one that hurts your credit, it'll show you as well. And then you can give them a call. And then if anybody has any questions, I'll put my contact information in there with my email and everything. And I know that there's going to be more, but that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Asiya. Alhamdulillah. That was a great uh, short and tight <laughs> with a lot of information. And clearly uh, our sisters are really interested in this topic and I'm sure more questions will come in. So just like Zainab said, um, please uh, drop your questions in there and we'll share Asiya's uh, contact information. Uh, by the end of this uh, evening. So with that, I'm going to um, introduce Sister Joanna. I love this Shiro. Uh, she's also like a mentor and um, she's just is amazing. Um, her bio is so long and it's because she's so amazing, but I only took out two paragraphs. <laughs> so here's her amazingness. Um, Joanna Osman is a serial social entrepreneur to support stranded Libyans in exile. She and her husband opened the first halal kosher restaurant in o Ohio in 1980. To facilitate the modesty requirements for Muslim sisters, she started a clothing manufacturing company, the Hijab Company. These initiatives helped build communities and support the families. They promoted pride in our identity during the first wave of anti-Muslim intimidation in the 80s and 90s. She currently directs Second Community Resource, and Second's vision is that all Minnesotans have access to stable homes and financial tools in alignment with their faith and values. They provide the education, resources for families and individuals to thrive without interest-bearing debt for home ownership, education, and retirement. So with that, I welcome Sister Joanna. This is really uh, wonderful. So I want to welcome everybody and hello, and uh, I'm really excited to be here. I didn't realize how um, formal this was going to be. I would have put together a slideshow, but um, I'm very informal tonight. So um, yeah, when uh, <laughs> it was so fun to hear my life story, um, I said, Allah. Um, so over the years, I've had a couple jobs and uh, a couple kids and a couple homes, inshallah. And um, I'm here now. And we started uh, Sakan Community Resource back in 2016. And it was in response to a realization that there are so many people, so many Muslims, very, um, very uh, observant Muslims who really understood what the Quran said, especially about um, financing. How do, how do we live our lives? How do we run our business? How do we um, take care of each other? How do we save? How do we, um, how do we live in this world that is generally 
not in agreement with the way we use money. Um, it, it, it's, it, it seems impossible. And, uh, and we are, thank God, in a, in a time when um, the United States is, <laughs> it, it is softening up on, on the, the ways that we can use money. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of rules have been, uh, a lot of acts have been passed that um, make it easier to, for people, just everyday people to um, like crowdfund a new uh, startup company or things like that. Those are, those are models that the Muslims have been using for thousands of years, by the way. Um, we're, we're thinking that these are very modern ways of using our money and they are actually the way everyone used to do it. We, uh, um, interest is a fairly new phenomenon and, um, and we know that it is mentioned in the Quran as uh, someone who's, who, who spends their life, you know, makes, makes their living by eating uh, riba or eating interest is uh, Allah and, and the angels have declared war on them. And, and then, then that's not to say that if you must, you know, if you must take a loan and pay interest, if you're in such a hard um, situation that you can't do anything except uh, get a loan and the only person that will lend to you is asking for money back, you can do that. You, when you're in hardship, you can do that. But we have from our Islamic heritage, we have so many wonderful ways of, of sharing uh, with our community in how do, we, how, do we, how do we start a business? How do we you know, get ready to, um, to get married? How do we um, save for our um, education? How do we save to buy a house? How do we buy a house? So there's, these are not new concepts. These have been around for years, centuries, even before Islam, but we have the Quran that has you know, made it um, obvious to us that there are certain ways to, to use money that are pro-social, you know, help, help the, the society grow. And then the ways that, that people use money that can take advantage of the weak or the, the poor or people that are uh, uh, under a burden for some reason. We don't want to be those people. We want to be the good people that are pro-social and, and working together. And um, so the reason that we started Second was that here in, uh, especially in the Twin Cities, but <laughs> all over the country, but, but Minnesota in particular, had um, a large influx of the uh, East African Muslim immigrants and that group was very, very opposed to using interest in, in, uh, in, in financing their lives. And in particular, not to use interest to buy a home. Um, and there was the background, you know, the, the understanding of the, what the Quran said, but also they felt that, you know, if I'm gonna be living in this home and I am going to raise children in this home, I, it needs to be as pure and uh, and and I need Allah's protection, so I should not be buying a home with with interest. So we at Sakan decided that this is our um, our first step in building financial stability in uh, in Minnesota, but among the the Muslim community in particular. And the reason is that many families who had been renters for twenty years and now have 10 kids, um, they could actually save money if they could buy their home, if there was a way for them to buy their home with no interest. Their, their monthly uh, payments towards housing, which was now rent, um, if they were to buy a home, well, in 2016, um, their payments would go down by almost a third. And we had one family that went down by, by two thirds. Um, 
if they could buy their home with a mortgage that had no interest. And at the time in 2016, there were, uh, there were two companies that were accepted by the, um, the Muslim scholars that we, uh, that we respect as saying that this, these companies will help you buy your home, finance your home without riba. And, and so I'll tell you what kind of the definition of riba so we can understand how these, these companies work. So riba in, in any kind of um, financing is if you borrow something, uh, anything. So if you borrow a, a, a bushel of wheat and the person that you borrowed it from says, okay, this is, you know, um, when you pay it back to me at the end of the year, I want you to give me a bushel and a third of wheat. So that third added onto it is considered riba. It is over and above what, what the person borrowed. So it could be money, it could be a car, it could be you know anything that has value. If, if the person is asking for more than what they lent you, that is considered riba. The reason that these mortgages are not using riba, even though they, you know, they talk about rates and percentages and things like that, is that you actually go into a partnership generally with, with the, the finance company. So the finance company, say you have 15% of the value of that house and the finance company pays the other 85% at the time when, you, when you're buying the house. So at that moment, you share in the ownership of that house. They have 85% and you have 15%. In in most in the the simplest models, they turn around at the at the closing table, you know, when you're at the title office, and then they start a new contract with you, and over time you start to buy them buy their their share from them. In Islam, you can sell something that you own, so they're acting like a real you know like a, a wholesaler in particular. So if you had a store and you were selling clothes, if you bought clothes for you know, bought a dress for $20 and you sold it for $20, that's awful business. You know, you're not going to make any money. But if you bought the dress for $5 and sold it for $20, that's good business. That's profit. No one would imagine and no one would attach the word interest to that idea. As Muslims, we understand that kind of business. But when it comes to a house and when, when we have this history of understanding that the only way you can buy a house is to get a loan. Um, and we know that interest is haram and we, we attach kind of, we get kind of, we forget, we forget the, the basic steps. So that, you know, that joint venture of buying this asset, which is the house, and then buying it back from the, the company over time, you're paying them for the um, for their making the 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 process affordable for you. So over time, you're going to be paying them more than the original twenty or what the eighty five percent that they they put in because you're actually living in that house and enjoying that house, and um, you pay for that service. In that case, it's a service that they're doing to, for you. Um, the other company that has a little bit different model it, and is kind of easier to understand is Guidance uh, Residential. And they, they make that first purchase with you uh, and they're 85% and you're uh, 15%. But once you bought that house, you are now living in 100% of that house. And so guidance will charge you a rent on the 85% that you don't own yet. And as you buy more of that house, the, your, their profit rate gets smaller and smaller or their, their, their lease payments get smaller and smaller. So once I've explained that. So we, um, at, at the time in 2016, only guidance was really had a, had a, had a 
recognizable name in, in Minnesota. Also Devon Bank out of Chicago was famous because it was also um, part of that, uh, I forget what they called it, but the out of the African Development Center, they were doing zero interest mortgages in, um, I think they started even in 2006. Um, and they were working with Devon Bank. They had, um, but people really didn't turn to them because they're in Chicago and everything. So we decided that um, we needed competition for guidance. Guidance was also not, um, not working with people that needed down payment assistance. So we invited UIF, which is University Islamic Finance, um, to, to start doing residential mortgages. So, so meaning for buying a house. They were doing commercial mortgages. So pretty much every, every masjid that you know um, in the Twin Cities was probably financed through um, UIF. And um, because they were the biggest name in, in commercial, commercial mortgages. So UIF opened up an office and hired people, local people, people that we know and are related to. And um, they hit the ground running. And guidance was like, uh-oh, we've got competition. And um, UIF also started reaching out to other nonprofits for to work with them with down payment assistance. So a lot of these families, after we had Sister Asia's presentation about credit, so many of the families that wanted to buy houses, needed to buy houses, they had no credit scores at all or really crappy credit scores. And, um, and if they had been, you know, taking, uh, using the, the Section 8 vouchers, they weren't even allowed to have savings. So nobody had decent credit scores and nobody had any savings whatsoever for that down payment. So we, uh, we at second, we um, were looking online to see, you know, who's got down payment assistance, how can we find down payment assistance, and then we realized that um, down payment assistance, is, uh, they are loans, and different organizations or, you know, towns or states or counties that do down payment assistance, some of them um, charge you interest when you pay it back. You know, they give you $10,000 as a loan, but then you start paying on it the, the, at the same time you're paying on your mortgage. And we're like, mm, we can't do that. that that's, it, it, it really negates the whole process of, of using the zero interest mortgages. So um, there were a few zero interest uh, down payment assistance programs available. And then those ran out. And then um, second, you know, we were like, there's, there's no more money left. So we, uh, some of our partners applied to the state of Minnesota to um, provide zero interest um, down payment assistance loans. And we got them and then those ran out. And so we reached out to our um, wealthy Muslim brothers and sisters in the Twin Cities and we raised, um, the first time we raised $192,000 to make um, down payment assistance of $10,000. And, um, and we helped 17 families buy their homes in the first, from, from 2017 to 2018. Um, 17 families, and then we you know, just helped them in anywhere we could. And then we reached out to another organization called um, NeighborWorks Home Partners. They're here in, I'm, I'm in St. Paul. So they're here in St. Paul um, up the street. And they, uh, we applied at, from, from Minnesota Housing for, to match our $80,000 that we collected again. And the state matched it. So we had enough money for 16 houses. And um, we're, that's still open, but we made it a little difficult. Um, so as Sister Asia was talking, um, we, you know, we all realize that many of us don't even understand credit and we don't understand the tyranny of the credit score. 
in the United States. Um, as she mentioned, you if you have a decent credit score, you might be able to um, negotiate for for your you know what what uh, your loans are going to be charging. You can even uh, pay less on your car insurance if you have a decent credit score. You might not be accepted or uh, at a at a at a new um, rental place because you've got a terrible credit score, or they're going to charge you, you know, a big uh, security deposit, and then, you know, first month's rent and last month's rent. So, I mean, your credit score really determines how your financial life in this in this country. So we realized, yeah, we can help a lot of people um, qualify for a mortgage because they need down payment assistance. But what about the people that have don't have good credit scores? Or what about the people who don't have a really um, reliable income and substantial income to pay for that mortgage over 30 years. So we started, we partnered with another organization called um, Build Wealth Minnesota. It's a, it's a nonprofit that um, developed an amazing, wonderful financial education program that is called Family Stabilization Plan. And it's a 10 week course and it is geared towards communities of color that have traditionally been denied access to, to finance, to home ownership, to starting businesses. Um, so it's like step by step by step. Uh, we, we don't even talk about credit until unit five because we're talking to people about, you know, how much do you spend every month? How much do you make? I mean, a lot of people don't even know how much they spend every month. And um, so we're tracking and we're, uh, we're talking about savings. And many times when people get, you know, they get uh, a raise or something like that, instead of setting it aside or setting a portion of it aside, they spend it because it's the first time they had the ability to spend. So we realize that if even if, especially if we're going to help people buy a home, we better be sure that they're not going to lose that home after a couple of years because they weren't financially stable. So we started teaching that um, financial education class. It's amazing. And we thought that it was for, you know, one group of people and you know, the people that had big families and were, you know, medium to low income, but needed to buy homes. Everybody, every time that we teach that class, we've got a different group of people. I had um, one, one class, we had two guys in there. Uh, one was late, late teens and his brother was in uh, mid twenties. And I said, okay, what is your goal in, in taking this class? And the older guy said, I'm gonna buy a duplex and I'm gonna make somebody else pay my mortgage. And I was like, yes. And when you're finished with this class, you're going to teach the next one. So, I mean, really, Mashallah, I was so proud of people. But the fear was, and, and, and what we saw was most of the people taking that class really did not understand our, our American system. They also, um, they also thought that you cannot use a credit card without paying interest. And we showed them over time, oh, my gosh. You can use that credit card and never ever pay interest on it. And you can use it like this amazing tool to make your, your credit score go up and up and up and up. So one of our recent um, students, I, I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share a thing. We, we told him this uh, kind of step one is pay, pay on time and pay often. So, um, and, and also keep your, keep your spending below a third of, of the, the, the credit limit. And if you, so the, they, what they taught us at, uh, at Build Wealth was they're talking to a room full of people that are using cash, cash for everything. And they said, you, so use this credit card for the things that you use cash for, and then go online and pay it off. 
never let it get any, they, and they say, never let it get more than 10%. And you mentioned that, Sister Asi, I remember that. So, and, and you'll just watch the numbers go up and up and up and up. So I've got a, uh, I have, let's see, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Bismillah. Okay. Bismillah. This one. Okay, so can you see that? Can everybody see it? So Sister Asia was saying this. Um, she was saying that 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 thirty five percent of your credit score uh, is based on that payment history, and then and the the rule of thumb for that one is pay on time and pay often. And so many people, when I tell them that, what do they mean by pay often? Of course, they pay every month, right? And I said, no, 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 you can pay two, three, four times in a month. And they're like, I can? I said, yeah, if that gets, you know, if you want to keep it under 10% 10, 10 of the credit limit, pay it when it gets to 10%, then it's down to zero again. The next 30% is um, the amounts that you owe, and that's that one third. Keep it below one third. You get points for keeping it below one third. You get points for using it. Don't just let it set aside. You get points for using it and paying it off. And then the, the, the last three are, how long have you had that thing? So many people close it out as she was mentioning um, when they haven't used it. And I got to tell you, I don't know how many people that I've coached, they all have a Kohl's card that they opened and never used. And so Kohl's closes it out after, after two years, I think. So I bet you all of you have a Kohl's card in there that's been closed out and you never went back. Um, you know, since it's a long time ago, you don't need that. But but now you're bigger, you're older, you've you've been living your life. The other one is the new inquiries, as she was uh, mentioning, um, that can, can be in. The, so the beginning of COVID um, two years ago, year and a half ago, um, People who, you know, those of us that had businesses or had, um, you know, uh, bills, <laughs> um, it was it was a problem. So we, I had one sister who has a has a business, and she had a payroll to make, and um, her business, I don't know, the, the 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 work was cut in half, and so she took out two or three credit cards within the, the, the first couple months of, of the COVID lockdown. Um, those, are, those are understandable and unavoidable, but um, mashallah, her credit was, was decent to begin with. Um, so don't do stuff like that unless it's absolutely necessary. So let's get back to um, home buying. Okay, where am I as far as the time is concerned? We have just a few more minutes Over. and then we're going to, no, we're, and then we're going to jump into Q and A. Okay. So, um, our, hmm, I will also share again, this one, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, where are we? This one? Oh, wait a minute. It's not showing. I don't know how to do this. Anyway, so um, when you come to second and you want some advice on how to get ready to buy your home, we will give you um, what we're calling the, um, the home finance resource sheet. And it talks about the three different companies that are now operating here in Minnesota. It's Guidance Residential, University of Islamic Finance and Devon Bank, uh, they all do um, uh, zero interest mortgages. Um, they are all, they have all been examined, you know, thoroughly by our scholars to, and, and they say that they have no riba. The problem is we've got a whole group of people in, in the Twin Cities who forget that, that the way they do business 
the way these companies do business is not a loan. So it's, it's, and it, it is a business. So they are doing a service for us by helping us buy our home and they get paid for their service, which, and they get paid a, a profit rate. Um, when we use when we use the American system to buy a home, we also have certain laws about um, home ownership that uh, we have to sign all of these papers. You've got a stack about you know four inches high of papers that you have to sign, 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 sign. The final papers that you sign are uh, are a list of all the payments you're going to make. There's 360 months in in 30 years of a mortgage. And each one of the, there's this chart says, you're gonna pay this much in towards your uh, principal and this much towards interest. Those papers are generated by a computer. The front page, the contract that you have with those companies is describing to you how they work. And it says, this is not interest. You will see the word interest in, you know, used in these different, um, paper, the documents that you will see from now on, know that these, that is not interest and, and they're just used for your, um, to, to make it easier for you to understand um, what we do. So, okay, talk to me. What, what questions are there out there? So this is a time you guys feel free to unmute yourself, ask your question for both of our speakers. Uh, keep it short so we have like it's going to be short question short answer so we have more people be able to ask their questions so go ahead uh, sister Jenna, there's questions in the chat too i don't know if you can see them Okay, I see the last one I saw. Uh, I'll, I'll, okay. Um, so from Tamika, uh, it says that the, what is the buying rates they charge? So generally, they will charge. They're, they, you know, they're American companies working in the American system and and also working in Minnesota. So they will look at what the, the local mortgage companies are charging, and they will charge you something close to that. They will also look at your credit score and see if, you know, if you've got a good credit score, the rate will be less. And if you have a poorer credit score, they might ask you to pay more. Um, they charge, they will charge you um, also. So those, that, that, that profit rate will be as, you know, a, like a half a point percentage point above or to one percentage point above, because these are small companies. They can't compete with, you know, big companies like, uh, like Wells Fargo or, or Rocket Mortgage or whatever. Those, those are huge companies and they can afford to, um, to charge you lower rates. But these are small companies that we're asking to help us buy our home. Um, and isn't rent lease payments still like interest? just a different name. No, not at all. Um, rent is rent and lease is lease. And it means that I am living in, I am living in a home that actually is owned 85% by another company. And so therefore I am paying them for the, the privilege or the purpose of living in that house. I don't have to live in that house. Um, uh, but if I, if I, rent it out to somebody else, I still have to pay for the use of that house. So um, they are absolutely rent payments. They are not interest. Um, let's see. I'm interested in buying a house and my parents have some savings. I will use my credit and I am the main one and they will just add uh, the money. Okay, so... Um, there's also an issue when you're buying a house, you, the, the, the money that is used for the down payment should be, should be yours. It has to be yours. 
um, and uh, if you are the name on the on the title. So if your parents are giving you the money for for the down payment, then they have to write a letter of uh, that they are giving you this money. So it's called a gift letter. It's a, called a family gift uh, letter. And because if they're lending you the money and you're going to pay them back, then that's more debt that you owe. And, and that will change how much the company is going to charge you for um, that. Because you not only do you owe them for the mortgage, but you owe your parents um, money that they said was a loan. So um, it would be it would be better if you um, saved for many years and um, or or the other thing that must be done is if your parents want to give you that money and they uh, and they put it in your you get it into your bank account at least three months ahead because the mortgage company is going to look at um, at two months of your of your um, bank statements, um, a lot of people want to use the Ayuto or the the the, the Jamaia or the you know lending circles or the saving circles for their money. Though. So I say, well, how much money do you have for a down payment? And they say, well, I've got I'll have thirty thousand in in March. So, okay, you're you're in involved in a in a lending circle, right? Go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said make sure that if you're gonna buy the house in March, that you get the money from the Ayuto into your account in January, at least three months or two months ahead of, of when you're gonna buy that house. Because um, that, it's your money. It, it, you know, it shows up in your banks, uh, in, your, in your check stubs. It, it shows probably that when you got your tax refund, but, um, but when it's been out in that circle, it, it needs to come back in unless you've got a statement and who's got a statement from the IOT, right? But there are, uh, there is a company out or there's a, a bank, a nonprofit bank out in California called Mission Asset Fund and they institutionalize the lending circles. And uh, if you ask me about it, I can send you information on how to um, get it. And they also, every time they 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 connect your bank to the, the circle so that they're sure that you're going to pay, and you know that they're going to pay you. And everybody else in that circle has been vetted through that um, through that bank, and they report your payments to the credit bureaus, so your your credit goes up. Can't can't do that with an IUTA. So um, there are there are organizations that actually understand, especially what uh, immigrants are going through. That you bring these wonderful customs from other places and they just don't understand it in the United States. <laughs> so um, actually tomorrow I'm talking to the um, to a group of a huge group of, of bankers and I'm going to say figure out how to um, institutionalize these lending circles and and establish them here in, in Minnesota. It, 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 it would be revolutionary. Anybody else? I have a question. Oh, Zainab, that has a question. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question for you, Asiya. Yeah. So today, okay, I I use my credit to five, four days ago to just buy like 150 train card for a month. Okay. Mm -hmm. It didn't show in my like my online payment, and in order to do the payment, I have to see it. So I saw it today, and my due date is tomorrow. But I already got my the Cisco, I don't know, like the credit score and 10 points down. I'm not understanding what's going on. It's, like, because, your it, credit, it's because your credit utilization went up. So if you pay it, it's going to go right back up. So, so it will happen sometimes where also write it in your calendar, have the date. So write down your statement date and your due date and write it in your calendar. So like you're not utilizing in the middle of like the statement and the due date. And then, you know, you're having a crazy hectic moment like this where your credit score is going to drop because your utilization is over 30%, you know? Um, I say always please stay below, 30% is fair, but we wanna be excellent. So just make sure that you're just always under the 10. Another thing that I do want to advise you guys on um, when it does come to your credit report and fast fixes, right? 
you guys, I work um, in credit. People ask me if I have a credit repair company. It's not credit repair, it's credit coaching. And yes, I do assist with sending out letters. The thing is a lot of people call me and say, well, could I fix my credit in 45 days? No, it's just not possible. Like there is no possible. If anybody ever tells you, actually, if you ever pay somebody before you provide us, before they provide a service, it's illegal. So they need to provide you a service, a service as in giving you something before you, and that's under the FCRA. So just make sure that you're not paying anybody to give you credit advice because it's illegal. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention is there's no fast fixes. So when you are fixing your credit, just remember that like, it's not going to be easy. It's going to take some time. Could things come off of your credit? Yes. Are there, are there inaccuracies? Yes, but it's not going to take 30 to 45 days for a change to happen. And if anybody promises you that with a ton of money and because you are vulnerable and you want to buy a house and you want to do these things, they're lying to you. Okay. So don't do it, please. I'm protecting you. <laughs> um, so, and I see that happen a lot. A lot of my clients actually have, um, actual things happen to them, lost thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, one of my recent clients just today, this morning, lost $3,000, $3,000. Somebody literally ran off with her money, promised her, and mind you, we can't promise anything, promised her that they're going to delete everything off of her credit report. You guys, unless it's verifiable, there's no way that anything is going to get deleted off of your credit report. You cannot promise someone that everything is going to get deleted. So if somebody promises you that too, just be aware of that. Um, and beware of actual scams that do actually happen when it comes to that. So just be careful. That's one thing that I did want to didn't want to mention, especially during the times like this, where you are super vulnerable because you want to get into a house, want to change your situation. It's like, you know, a time of, you know, I want to change the new year's coming up. I want to do something. You see, go and research something on Google. Then an ad comes up on Instagram telling you that things are going to, you know, delete in 30 days. Don't believe them. Stay away from them. Okay. Um, is Credit Karma a good resource to check your credit? Absolutely not. Um, credit Karma actually does not have um, accurate credit reporting. It's not, it, the number does not matter. Your actual report matters. So I did give you guys the annual credit report.com. I have a partnership with Smart Credit for my clients. It does give you identity theft protection and credit reports every 30 days. And that in itself, the basic is $15 a month. But as of right now with COVID, if you cannot afford the, um, you know, the insurance and all of that, you could literally go on annualcreditreport.com and I'll type it in the chat and you guys can get a free credit report every 30 days and just make sure that you're just pulling that. The number really does not matter if your credit report looks crappy, right? Like it really does not matter. You could have a 700 credit score and still get declined for certain things because you have something that's on your credit report that needs to change. So what about when you, um, when your credit run, uh, how much does it go down? It all depends. So like it could, let me give you guys an example. I had a client go to a car dealership and I hate car dealerships because they, oh my God. So they literally, will take your credit and run it like it's nothing. I call it, they, it's like a faucet. They turn on the water and it's just running because they literally, my client had 17, 17 inquiries from this specific car dealership. And then one thing I will tell people is, um, <laughs> car dealership spam. One thing I will tell you is please do not go to a car dealership right away when you're buying a car. Go to, um, you know, you guys, there is the Bank of Whittier in California. They do have where you could actually contact them and you do not have to live in California to get personal loans, car loans and stuff like that. Do contact them. I actually have um, someone who actually went through with them. Um, contact and those are, it's a riba free. I don't know I have never really looked into it. And I don't know, Sister Joanna, if you ever heard of them as well. Um, and if you want to look into them, but Bank of Whittier is, uh, it's, not, it's an actual Islamic bank um, in California. And I heard a lot of good things about them. I did read through everything. I did my research, but you know, to each their own, I haven't gotten it yet. I'm about to, I'm about to go and contact them. So I'll share more with you guys, but um, contacting um, your credit unions and trying to get like low interest um, or no interest at all, but make sure before you take out high level loans like that, that you work on your credit before that, because you, 
it does not matter what it is. You are going to get sucked into interest if your credit is bad. I'm telling you right off the bat, like there's no way you could run around that. Um, and that's the biggest thing. It's not something that they teach you in school. Don't feel like you are wrong or don't feel like you should have learned this because first off, we were not raised in a household that we taught, we were taught credit. You know, we were not financial literacy in my household was my mom telling me to save. And then I got my checks and then she took half of it. So, and I don't know where it went. That's just, you know, that's just what it is. Um, so don't feel like you have to know everything continuously keep learning. Um, and just take everything I said, please, especially when it comes to paying your bills on time and keeping your credit utilization low and stop applying for unnecessary cards. So I want to thank you, Sister Asia. We have a question here for Sister okay. Joanna. Um, have you heard of guidance residential? Uh, I'm thinking about using them as a lender, but I don't know much about them. Are they a good company to go through or do you have any recommendations? Uh, yes, I've heard of Guidance Residential. Um, they are one of the biggest companies that doing zero interest mortgages here in the state. Um, and there is University of Islamic Finance and Devon Bank, and you should go to all of them and make, make them compete with each other for your business. So if you have good standing and you have a, 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 you know, a decent amount of savings to put down in your own home, then make them do the work for you. Uh, don't just go to one or the other. We also have in this, uh, in the housing uh, home buying resource um, sheet, we have a, a list of, I think it's 10 now, um, realtors who get paid by the seller. They, they work for you for free. And Everyone in our list understands the Islamic finance um, model, and they will give you great advice as, as you're looking for a home. And they will do all of this, um, all of the paperwork and, and make the appointments for inspections and appraisals and all of the things um, for you. And you don't have to pay them. They get paid by the seller. So, um, those people will connect you to the the title agency, the 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 the, the three different um, mortgage companies. Um, these, you know, you're not expected to know all of this, but you're expected to um, seek out good advice, and so you should choose a realtor to help you with it, so that you can work hard and keep saving money until you find the house that's that's going to be yours. Thank you, Sister Joanna. And then there's another one in the chat um, in my from Aisha. Uh, I think this one, I, I think, is on, on a lot of people's minds. Um, in her experience, uh, she applied for a mortgage with a company called Ijara. They claimed to be Sharia compliant, and then uh, they sold her loan to Wells Fargo Mortgage. Mortgage is interest. Is it interest if these companies take payments from you to pay a traditional mortgage? And what's really sad is that now you. She has lost trust in companies that call themselves Islamic. Okay, so there's a couple there's a couple problems with that. Um, the, you know, I'll tell you how this works. Um, okay, I'll tell you the 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 the, the halal way, and then how Ijara kind of got got away with it. So, guidance um, guidance you know, does it in the halal way and all of them, all of the companies that you're going to be um, dealing with, all of the halal companies, um, all they do is the purchase. They, they help you buy that house. And in order to help the next family buy their home, they sell that contract that you've made. They sell the contract and that's called securitization. So they, they sell that to a market for mortgages, and then they get their money back and they go on. There's another company that is involved in your mortgage from then on, and they're called the servicer. So a mortgage servicer is usually a bank. It is, it's, it is a company that, that Guidance or UIF or Devon Bank um, hires, actually Devon does it themselves, but um, they hire another company. So, so every month your payment is gonna go 
towards your principal, towards your ownership, towards your um, uh, one month's worth of home, home buyer's insurance, uh, one month of property tax, uh, and probably because you didn't, you didn't put in 20% for the down payment, something else called private mortgage insurance. So there's a lot of people that get paid with your monthly payment. So the servicer company is like an accountant firm and they make sure that everybody gets paid and you should be, you know, you should love your servicer because they pay your taxes and you will hold on to that house until you get it paid off. Um, the problem is Guidance hired US Bank to do their servicing. And it scares the stuff out of Muslims because all of a sudden, instead of paying guidance, the first day when at, at the closing, they pay guidance. And then after that, they start paying US Bank. And that sounds like it's proof that, that there's riba involved in this. It's just another you know, mortgage and, and guidance was lying to us. No, it's not true. They have hired US Bank and we are familiar with US Bank because their headquarters is here in Minneapolis, but um, UIF also hired, it's called Midwest Loan Servicing or Mid Midwest Mortgage Servicing Bank. And um, so all of them actually hire another company, hire another bank even, but they are not paid with interest. You don't, you your money um, does not pay them at all. Actually, they're being paid by by the um, the mortgage company. So um, that scares people. But and and people that have had the guidance um, mortgages for several years, all of a sudden, somebody from the marketing department of of U.S. Bank will call them up and say, "Hey." You know, brother, or they'll say, Mr. Hassan, you've had, you've been a great customer to U.S. Bank for the last six years. And they go, No, I haven't. Oh, yes, you have. Well, I, I, I've been paying my money to, to guidance. Guidance helped me get my house. Well, no, you've been paying us, and we could get you a better deal if you refinance with a U.S. U.S. Bank mortgage. And then at, at that point, then they, they freak. And I have heard of people who sell their house at that, after that phone call because they felt like they've been paying interest all of these years. They have not. But they use these words. And, and the bank, you know, one side of U.S. Bank doesn't know what the other side of U.S. Bank does. Or they'll say, we'll give you the same deal that, you know, that guidance gave you. They're lying. They can't do that. By law, banks cannot do what these zero interest mortgage companies do. Um, let's see, did I answer the question right? Let's see. Um, so they're not loans and they did, uh, okay, so so the Ijara. Okay, Ijara is is a problem. Um, Ijara, <laughs> Ijara, God bless them. They, um, they tell you to get a mortgage from a, a a conventional mortgage. And then they, they put your mortgage inside of a trust. So when, which is, has their name on it, I guess, the Ajara Ashur Trust or whatever. And, and so you don't pay Riba, you're actually paying Ijara. But Ijara pays that bank. So it, it's like I get to pay more so Ijara can make more because they have to pay interest. So it's, it's BS. It's absolute, you know, it, 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 it doesn't make sense. Um, there are some scholars that, that say that it, it's halal. I think it's ridiculous. And the scholars that we are consulting with from the uh, Assembly of American Muslim Jurists say that Ijara and the other company called La Riba are full Riba. So don't, don't be fooled. Uh, anybody else?
Uh, thank you, Sister Joanna. Um, we love listening to you. You're just, you're just <laughs> full of wealth and so many stories. And even you, Asia, I really appreciate all the stories that you've been able to share because it really humanizes the experience and makes us realize like what um, we can learn and grow from those. Um, it is 7.30, so I want to be uh, very cognizant of everybody's time. And so I feel like Sister I want to add <laughs> something real quick. I'm sorry. I'm yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. So the 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 way you know that this these Islamic uh, mortgage models are absolutely halal is when stuff goes wrong. If if the market is healthy and happy and you know it doesn't look any different from uh, um, a conventional mortgage. But I'll tell you what happened um, to UIF and also guidance uh, in, in different ways. But UIF, you know, in 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 the in the mortgage crisis of uh, 2008, 9, 10, um, they had quite a few ho homes that they had um, financed around the country, and um, they did not have any defaults. Default. Uh, they did not have any foreclosures. Foreclosure means the the family, you know, the the, the company is going to get their their house back from from the home buyers because they can't pay. What they did have is one default. And the reason was that one default in the whole country, by the way, um, because what happened in, in 2008 and nine was everybody else foreclosed. And when other conventional banks um, mortgages um, take their homes, take the family's home back, they sell it for the, the least amount, you know, whatever they can get. And so the vultures are out there and they buy these houses for half and a third of what the original loan was. But if you had a conventional mortgage, you still owe that original mortgage company all the money, even though you sold the house for half of the, 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 the loan amount, you still owe them money and you will continue to owe them money for the rest of your life, probably or until you declare bankruptcy. In the situation with this UIF home, um, all those houses around them were foreclosed on. And so they were sold at half of the price of, of what the, you know, they originally cost. And so that made the, the value of this UIF home drop down by half. So if they had, if they had a mortgage for 300,000, now the, the house is valued at 150000 and they're paying payments to UIF. And it, why, why would I do that? So they reached out to UIF and said, what are we going to do? I mean, this is, this is ridiculous. This doesn't make sense. Um, UIF said, okay, well, let's, let's, let's postpone payments or let's reduce payments for a while. Let's wait for the, market, the market to maybe come back, bounce back. They waited for a year with these kinds of um, modifications. And, and it didn't get better. So UIF at that time was 75% owner of that house and the, the family was 25% owner of the house. So they sold it at the highest price they could sell it for. And then they divided the, what was, because they're joint owners. They have joint, they are joint owners of this asset, the house. So UIF, UIF took their 75% and the family took their 25% and they went back to, to renting. But they didn't owe UIF anything because they, it was the house that was, they were both stakeholders in, the, in that house. And that, will, that happens with all of the three companies that I've been talking about. It does not happen with any of the, the conventional mortgages. That's where it shows you that this is not a loan. This is not a conventional mortgage. These are truly Islamic and halal. Ta-da. Thank you, Sister Joanna. I really appreciate that. Um, I know it's really hard to understand the differences between what is halal and haram and sharia and non-sharia, especially with interest and usury and uh, and yeah. Ribba, so greatly appreciate you educating us on that. And so it is past 7.30, so I think what we're going to do is um, 
just remind you that we dropped uh, the contact information for both Sister Joanna and Sister Asia into the chat. Um, and we also uh, put um, their websites out on, on the chat as well. And this recording is going to be shared out with all the attendees uh, probably within the next few days. So you'll have access to this. And if you have questions, please reach out to them. But with that, we were really appreciative that you were all here tonight. Um, I'm going to ask Zainab to close us out with the dua, but I just want to make sure I saw her drop out. Okay, there she is. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, may Allah make this, barakal, this event barakal on all of us. And may Allah make everyone's efforts uh, going forward, either with buying house or avoiding interest, um, a better result. And uh, mm -hmm. All right, Jazakallah khair, everyone. Thank you all for uh, joining us tonight. And inshallah, we will drop a link to the survey. Please share. Uh, your thoughts with us and inshallah will um, we'll, we'll tell us what you would like to learn more next time and then we will inshallah try to bring more workshops to the sisterhood. But thank you so much. Take care. Assalamu alaikum.